I'm going to go hardcore into spoilers because I'm assuming that anybody who is interested in this knows about it by now. If you somehow haven't played Undertale yet and you want to keep the story a surprise, do not watch this. But if you can hit the like button anyways, I'd appreciate it. One year ago today, Toby Fox released Undertale to massive success. I've spent quite a while milling over my time with Undertale, trying to figure out what it is that gives it that magical spark. I started playing the game wanting to pick it apart because it had a rabid fanbase who thought it was perfect, and I'm a dick. However, I couldn't help but fall in love with it myself, and the more I think about it, the fonder I become. People have chalked up the success of Undertale to many things. An unconventional combat system, Earthbound-inspired nostalgia, memes... And while all of these elements do play a part, I think they're all tied together and supported by a single large thread. Theming. Yeah, I'm talking about theming again. You want another trick? Buy a different pony. Determination. Everybody knows it plays a role in the game, and even I'm annoyed by the lazy jokes, but it's more than a meme. It's the theme behind the entire experience. Determination is, according to the dictionary, an identification of the taxonomic position of a plant or animal. A more relevant definition is a firm or fixed intention to achieve a desired end. Now, Undertale is far from the only story to use determination as a theme. I would argue that it's actually one of the most common themes in any medium of storytelling. Nearly every successful story, from Harry Potter to Homer's epics, contains some semblance of determination in their protagonists. And they should. Determination, the ability to see a future and make it happen, is one of humanity's identifying traits. We are not the strongest or the fastest animals in the world, but we rose to the top thanks to thumbs and our ability to change the way that the world works. You can see this mirrored in Mass Effect. It's one of the boldest attempts at storytelling in its medium to date, and the reason it was able to keep players coming back for a three-game story was how compelled they were to help Shepard, and humanity, do the impossible. Our libraries and theaters are full of tale after tale of mankind against overwhelming odds, and somehow finding a way. It inspires. It gives us hope. This desire to shape the future is a universal compulsion. It drove leaders centuries ago, and it drives political movements to this day. Determination is real, it's powerful, and it's nothing new. Undertale just took it deeper than any game I can think of. Undertale's story has an unassuming start. A human child has fallen into a world of monsters and wants to get home. A simple premise, but an effective one. The desire to be home is universal part of human nature, and something that players can relate to in an instant. That concept of home, and what it means, serves as an important anchor as the narrative gets going. The game's first section introduces you to Toriel, who provides comfort, warmth, and anything else a child could want from a mother. At this point in the game, there's still a facade of innocence plastered over the occasional sinister undercurrents. Toriel quickly endears herself to the player through her constant doting and bumbling attempts at motherhood. The offer to stay with her instead of risking death to get back to the other humans is tempting. She does everything she can to protect you from the dangerous world around you, and you can, if you wish, stay there forever. However, if you do, you don't move forward. Of course, in any game, the natural inclination is to move forward. In Undertale, it's no different. But Toriel's house achieves something that most games struggle with in their journey from waypoint to waypoint an emotional attachment to the place that you're leaving. Thinking back on it, the only other time I can remember feeling even the slightest bit of regret at moving on from a location was when I played Final Fantasy VII as a child and had to leave Midgar. With the whole party sitting on the ground outside, you get the sense that, even though moving forward is your only option, there is something being left behind. The main difference being that Midgar contains the lives that these people have led so far, while Toriel is offering a place to start life over. A new home. The concept of home, of belonging, is possibly the greatest emotional need hardwired into the human consciousness. Second, perhaps, only to something like love or family. 
So even though Toriel can't provide the child with everything they've lost, she tries to give them comfort and safety. Even if only on a subconscious level, that's worth something. And this brief moment of warmth and belonging helps frame the consequences of the brutal choices to follow. Both the protagonist and the monsters have lost their home. And while many of the monsters have resigned themselves to this new home, the child is determined to return. <laughs> Leaving Toriel as your first major act of defiance. The player flirts with this concept all throughout the ruins. How long do you wait for Toriel to return before heading on yourself? How often do you follow the rules? Little choices like these are sprinkled throughout the first section of the game. While these decisions carry very little weight for the most part, their real purpose is to inform you that your morality is entirely in your own hands. Now, as Toriel stands in your way, you have your first important choice. What will you do in order to keep moving forward? Are you willing to kill? Or will you abstain from taking another life to serve your goal? A wonderful touch in this fight is one that some players don't realize at first. No matter how long you fight and how damaged you are, Toriel refuses to take your life. This is a light tap on the player's shoulder, telling them that even this conflict can be resolved peacefully. While a lot of games play with the idea of karma or morality, they're often very heavy-handed in letting you know your choices. Undertale instead lets these scenarios play out naturally. Instead of the player trying to game the system, they're left responsible for their own actions. This has resulted in player after player killing Toriel, feeling crushed when they realize it actually happens, and trying to restart their save to bring her back. A genuinely emotional response that the game handles brilliantly. Once you leave Toriel, you've set yourself down a path. Depending on whether you killed her or refused to fight, you're headed towards a number of different endings. While every ending is funny and makes nods to the choices you made, they feel a little incomplete and even tell you to go back and get a better ending. While Undertale is filled with nuance and branching narratives, its most compelling endings come when you commit to one of two extremes, pacifism or genocide. When people talk about why Undertale is brilliant, they talk about the pacifist-genocide dichotomy and how it subverts expectations of video games. Playing an RPG where you don't have to kill every monster you come across is great technical commentary. However, we aren't machines. We can understand and appreciate these statements on game design, but they can't move us. They're valuable, clever, and insightful, but they're also cold, objective, and ultimately emotionless. This isn't to decry Toby Fox's commentary on games. If anything, it makes it stronger. Not only did he make a game that deconstructs the nature of take-turn combat, he combined it with themes and a narrative that speak to the nature of humanity as well. The distinction between pacifism and genocide is more than a game mechanic. It's an ethical question. What kind of world do you want, and how far will you go to create it? It's a loaded question. It's one that we've asked for a long time. It's what makes Batman so interesting compared to, say, Superman. Superheroes like him are gods who can defend an entire planet, obliterating any threat. While the stakes are high on a planetary scale, they never get too high emotionally, because we know the hero will always win. They're super, after all. But Batman is just a man. When asked what kind of world he wants, he chooses one without crime. However, he can never actually accomplish this, no matter how much he tries. Unlike heroes who have new goals introduced and accomplished every arc, Bruce is trying to do a single job bigger than himself. That determination is what makes him so appealing and relatable, because it also allows him to fail. And he does. But losing doesn't diminish his purpose as a character like it would with other heroes. Robin's death, Barbara's crippling, these failures create Batman's most compelling stories. They let us deal with our own fears and failure through the eyes of someone who is, while a hero, still very human. 
Undertale uses this same theme of failure, albeit in a less brooding manner. Put simply, the same question you're being asked is being asked of every NPC in this game. Every character has something they want to accomplish, and they are very rarely able to. They fall short just like we do. This is played off for laughs in most cases. The monsters you fight are struggling comedians, unable to confess their love for you, or just... Jerry. Papyrus wants to be an intimidating warrior like Undyne, but his traps are abysmal and he can't even make edible spaghetti. In a more serious tone, Toriel routinely fails to protect those close to her, and loses child after child. Alfie's might just have the most developed arc in the entire cast. It starts off with joke after joke about her inability to make friends, reaches a heartwarming moment where it's revealed how desperately she wants the player to like her, and eventually reveals that her crippling insecurity stems from her failure as a scientist. While attempting to inject monsters with determination to help them live longer, she wound up horrifically mutating them, something she's been hiding ever since. Her growth is huge, as she finally owns up to her failure and tries to move on from it. It's hard to think of a single character in the underground who doesn't fail in one way or another. As you play through the game, you help them finally achieve these goals, whether by playing matchmaker or simply paying for tuition. No matter how monstrous a character may seem at first, have them fall down enough times and they'll look just as human as you or me. After all, humans are all too used to failing. And, through failure after failure, humans have been known to possess a mysterious magical force that tells them to get back on their feet. Undertale makes it clear that there is one distinction between monsters and humans. Monsters lack the determination that humans draw their strength from. They used to coexist, but when the humans turned on them, they could do little to fight back, as one human was stronger than several monsters. In order to break out of the cave they've been imprisoned in, they need to collect human souls. After all, the human soul is much stronger than a monster's. So the king, Asgore, takes it upon himself to free his people. Whenever a child falls into the underground, he kills them, and collects their soul. Asgore is in a situation eerily similar to the player. He knows what he wants, but can he gather the determination to do it? How many children is he willing to kill? There's a moral conflict here, and it comes to a head at the end of the game. You see how hard this is for Asgore, how kind and simple he is, and how he has to steel himself to do what has to be done. Asgore is determined to save his people, even at the cost of his humanity. And so, a fight begins. A fight between two pacifists who can't achieve their goals without violence. Mercy is not an option. One thing Undertale does particularly well with its portrayal of morality is showing the consequences of sticking to one path or the other. Stories tend to be told in a very black and white manner, where doing the right thing is rewarded with nothing but sunshine and rainbows. After you've beaten Asgore into submission, you can choose to spare him. But, if you do, all you've done is left him vulnerable to another assassin. You leave a void that Flowey is only too happy to fill. By choosing pacifism, you make accomplishing your goals harder. By never crushing those in your way, you never gain strength, and those in your way only get more difficult. Of course, the hard thing is often the thing worth doing, and finally reaching the true pacifist ending of Undertale gives an incredible payoff. And then, there's genocide. As much as we talk about the virtue of determination, of mankind's inspiring ability to overcome impossible odds, there's a dark underbelly. What happens when somebody has determination, but not empathy? Determination is shared by the good and evil alike. Martin Luther King and Hitler. Two extreme sides of the same coin. The story of Undertale unfolds in a wildly different fashion if you choose a ruthless approach. The light-hearted jokes and goofy antics of the underground's residents are trampled, replaced instead by fear. Fear of you. 
There's something deeply unsettling about the way the genocide route characterizes you. When you play something like Infamous or Fable, evil actions churn you into what society views as a villain. A gruff voice, over-the-top callousness, or a level of bravado that makes it easy to distance yourself. There's a pageantry that takes the edge off of the impact of your actions. Undertale doesn't tell you you're evil. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're just doing what it takes to achieve your goal. After all, everybody is the protagonist in their own life. As you slaughter monster after monster, the background music disappears and you walk through empty towns. When you kill a major character, they die in shockingly quiet, serene ways. And the entire time, you say nothing. Frisk, the child you're controlling, is just a conduit for your actions. And that means that whatever you do, you bear the full responsibility. There's no character to shield you from the despair you're forcing these monsters into. You are your actions. This belief is expressed by Sans, the nihilist who passively observes every playthrough or timeline, and only steps in to stop you when you're at your absolute worst. Even though nihilism is more or less the opposite of determination, when faced with the consequences of letting you kill Asgore, he can no longer afford to stand by. If the pacifist ending is a message of hope, the genocide route is a warning. As humans, we have an incredible capacity to accomplish anything we set our minds to. But just because we can do something, doesn't mean we should. For all the progress that we've made as a species, a lot of it came at great cost to others. Determination is all well and good, but unless tempered with empathy, we risk a legacy of fear rather than hope. Perhaps Toby Fox's greatest choice when it came to theming Undertale was to emphasize it very little. Some writers, in games especially, lean into the message behind their game to the point where it feels preachy. When you're aware of a lesson somebody's trying to teach you, the human tendency is to resist it, to roll your eyes and assert how little control they have over your thoughts. Undertale has its share of speeches, but they're often humorous or layered with a sense of irony and seldom have an outright philosophical bent. When characters do get serious, they get serious in a simple, honest way. The game never takes the tone of a wise scholar who's chosen to let you in on their great wisdom. Asgore doesn't deliver the infamous, we're not so different, you and I speech. He merely feels the weight of the situation as one naturally would from his perspective. Either Toby understands how much more powerful themes are when they're left in the background, or I've read too much into everything. Either way, does it really matter? One of the greatest aspects of art is how it grows amongst its audience. The artist may or may not have intended to have symbols in the work they create, but what matters is how it affects the audience. If you write something honest, the audience will make their own connections. I don't know if these themes were intended by Toby Fox, but it doesn't diminish how much Undertale made me think. I could go on for hours talking about themes and philosophies I didn't cover, and there are a wealth of other YouTubers and journalists who have made compelling articles about material that I didn't even touch on. Undertale is a wonderful exploration not just of game mechanics and RPG tropes, but of human nature. In so many ways, Undertale is a great example of storytelling, and I hope you found it as interesting as I did. With any luck, the bar set by Toby Fox will inspire a new wave of artists to create more narratives this touching and human. After all, it just takes a little determination. Hey guys, thanks for watching this. This was just a fantastic video to work on. I played Undertale a year ago now, and I'm still just excited to talk about it and think about it. Yeah, it, it really is a special game to me, and to so many other people. Like it's, it's unreal how big this game got with how humble its beginnings were. I want to thank Ace Waters and Rashadi B for letting me use their music in this. They've made a fantastic cover album of Undertale music that you've been listening to called Determination. Please go check it out if you haven't heard of it somehow. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.